the uh, uh, actually store, you know, called the Walmart. And and I'll just give you an example, you know, that uh, uh, IBM, it's an IBM based blockchain uh, actually technology, which helps trace the food origins, right? It's just the food origins, you know, that people will get to know where this food uh, originated from, where it's coming from. I mean, these are the features, you know, that blockchain is introducing um, in, in the industry. So uh, Amar Sab, excellent work. I'm uh, very impressed with uh, uh, Dr. Irfan's, you know, presentation, a good start to this, um, you know, presentation. I won't take too long, but these are the few things that I wanted to just add in and over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Uzma. Great resource. Now I request uh, Mr. Shahrukh Khan, he's a charter account by profession, and uh, we are banking on him about uh, number of uh, fintech technologies and uh, linking blockchain uh, with the uh, audit and account side of the initiative. Over to you, Shahrukh, please go ahead. Uh, uh, so how can I uh, share my screen if I wanted yeah, to? You, you the... can, if you are allowed, you can share your screen. Oh, okay. Let me just set, the, set things up, just a minute. Um, can you guys see the screen now? Yeah, very clear. Please go. Okay, so um, I'm Shahrukh Malik. Uh, as uh, Marsa mentioned, I would be talking about blockchain and how to use this in financial systems. So uh, before we uh, dive into how current systems work, let, let's take a short trip down memory lane on how the old financial systems used to work. So initially, everything was uh, built through a ledger system, which was basically a record on a paper or, you know, if we go even back uh, on pieces of letter. And this person uh, gave this much money or this much of a commodity to another person. Um, but since we are talking about financial systems uh, and uh, in very broad terms, a financial system is a system that enables exchange of funds. Um, and in modern terms, um, this constitutes banks, financial markets, financial instruments, and all of those things that we are already aware of. If we see the history uh, in terms of technology and financial systems, we see that the first ever uh, digital financial service was started in 1918, which was a while back. And then in 1995, we saw the first virtual bank open up and followed shortly by PayPal, which was the first digital wallet. And then coming over to uh, 2009 almost, which was uh, devised as the era of cloud computing, there was a secret work uh, research that being undertaken by a group in 2009, which was Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was the first ever introduction of blockchain to the world. Uh, and it got a lot of steam, uh, both in terms of uh, you know, the positive natures and also the controversy. Um, but in 2013 and uh, subsequently in 2017, the, the price of Bitcoin, Bitcoin started going so much uh, higher in terms of uh, return investment that people actually started noticing uh, cryptocurrency. And in return, they also started noticing blockchain. Uh, so what happened was everyone was interested in blockchain by 2017 and all of the major uh, consulting firms and also the major cloud providers, they started offering their own uh, uh, blockchain or cryptocurrency front ends. So the position now is that a lot of governments are accepting cryptocurrency. Um, th there are a lot of uh, big companies that are trying to use blockchain for supply chain management, for funds transfer, and all, all of those things. And every cloud provider is uh, providing blockchain as a service, including Microsoft, which had uh, Ethereum, uh, IBM has Hyperledger, and there are there are a lot of others as well. Um, there are some controversy, uh, you know, um, surrounding blockchain as well, but you know that's how things are. Um, so, what is blockchain? So, blockchain is basically a distributed ledger system, uh, which is uh, more than one uh, uh, software or, or hardware. It's basically a suite of technologies. What it what in, essentially for financial systems, what it may, means is, is is that it is a file store, basically. You can record a financial transactions, medical records, land titles, anything that you think of, you can record in a blockchain. Uh, the way it works, uh, it, how it is different is that uh, three things basically uh, uh, lead to the benefits of blockchain. The first one is how it uh, tracks data and how it stores data. Well, so what it does is it creates a block for every transaction that you make. So think of this like a uh, funds transfer or uh, an, any accounting uh, record. It would basically generate a block for that. And what a blockchain system would do is that it would link all of these transactions in a historical chain. Uh, that's where the name blockchain comes. 
uh, and then link them up with a cryptographic hash. So at the end of this, there would be a specification on a timestamped time server stamped. that this uh, uh, amount or this uh, status of this specific item change to this other item. So in a real sense, it could mean, uh, for example, uh, a person buys a land from another person. So at the end of the blockchain, it would state that and buy something from Dave. This is uh, this uh, then proves that um, the current ownership is held by and. Um, so the, the benefit is, uh, is that if you yourself wanted to change your own data or some of the data that you have on record, uh, you could change it, but the network would capture it and it will then revert it back. This is because you're not uh, in the blockchain yourself. You're connected to a network which is actually decentralized and distributed. So if even someone else wanted to change something, the whole network would identify um, the change and it will uh, notify the whole blockchain. So what this does, it, it creates that uh, trust in the data itself. So any financial systems that is that are based on blockchain, they automatically have a trust uh, in the data itself. So how this is proven is that because there's a cryptographic puzzle to be solved, uh, it is difficult to change the data itself. Secondly, uh, because um, every computer, every device that is processing the blockchain um, network, which is basically called mining, they have to undertake a proof of work system, or it could also be proof of stake or some other um, terminology. But in general case for Bitcoin and most, crypto uh, most cryptocurrencies, it's a proof of work. So because they're all connected uh, all connectedly connected and solving a puzzle together, they undergo a process called proof of work. So the, this system also uh, generates trust. And thirdly, because uh, the, the result of the proof of work is being verified by all of the nodes in the network, if someone was to you know, provide uh, wrong results, the other net nodes won't be able to verify it. And then you know that this transaction is not correct. What this means for uh, financial transactions is that you don't really need intermediaries. At this moment, you have to rely on lawyers and banks and financial institutions to process uh, transactions. But with blockchain, you can do it completely peer to peer. So going back to the example of N Steve, let's say that uh, there was a dispute on who owns a specific piece of land. Both of uh, those guys would have their own records available. They could share it with a lawyer who would then verify uh, the documentations available and then declare that you know whoever is the um, rightful owner. But we saw uh, in uh, this constitutes a lot of time and money. And as we saw with the blockchain, uh, that it is very easily provable just because it exists on the data. So that cuts down on the time and money involved. And what it allows is that a single block or basically a series of blocks leading up to that block, uh, which is basically shared by everyone, that can prove that you uh, own the specific line. So what this does, it, it connects people, it changes the way you're accessing data, it changes the way you're verifying data, it changes how you transact, how financial transactions go. Uh, but it has to be understood that blockchain is not a specific uh, application or software, it is a specific type of technology, and it's not even a single network. There are a lot of uh, blockchain networks out there for even a single uh, type of blockchain, for example, Bitcoin, there can be more than one network, and you have to understand that you have you can have the same technology powering up more than one network. So this, what this allows is that using the same technology, you can have public blockchains, private blockchains, and even public private hybrid blockchain. So some part is public and some part is uh, private. So that's it on the blockchain. I hope uh, everyone was able to understand how blockchains work for the financial transaction. Um, but let me also state what the problems are with the current system. So at the moment we lack trust uh, on data and people. So that is why we need intermediaries. Secondly, there is a high security risk uh, because of the cost that, and the cost of this is, is passed on to the consumer because all of the institutes who have to uh, provide security, they charge us for this service. Then there are there is manual recording even in the top tier banks. Uh, all of the reconciliations are done by humans, and there's a lot of uh, room for error, and also uh, there's a huge time cost. Uh, finally, there's a lack of traceability because everything uh, that is changed in the financial system has to be manually traced out and then reconciled, especially when this when it's an inter-party transaction. So the solution with blockchain comes uh, by uh, increased stress in the data itself because the data cannot be changed. If it's written down by the right party, which is also signed by the right party, it means that the, the record is final and it is uh, you know correct. Uh, there, it includes high traceability because everything is in a soft form. It is very easy for APIs and software to access the data and then uh, you know convey any summaries that you need.
finally it is uh, automatic because you know like i said it's all uh, digital and uh, it is also inherently secure because of uh, the specific um, transaction structure that we're going the, it does pose some set challenges blockchain uh, is not very um, let's say regulated in a sense so it does have uh, it it does need some uh, work to be done in the legal framework which is uh, one of the main um, purposes of uh, blockchain center of pakistan to help uh, pakistani government and also globally to develop uh, to devise a policy and to develop the whole uh, structure then because it's a new technology it's not very easily understood by the people so um, the one thing that people don't understand with blockchain is that you have to have personal responsibility in your digital assets uh, at the moment everyone is used to having a username and password but with blockchain it's a little different so you have to be personally responsible of uh, your digital keys and all of those things and not everyone understands that at the moment so that's a challenge on why uh, there's a low adoption on blockchain um thirdly there needs to be a cultural shift everyone is centered uh, you know everyone is uh, kind of uh, they know that a centralized server where you can you know there's just one data store which you can access and uh, you just have to secure that single point uh, that is the way that uh, the technology is uh, moving towards but with blockchain it goes back it doesn't uh, prefer centralized structures it actually wants distributed systems so there needs to be a cultural shift on the developer side on that they need to realize this and finally um in some cases blockchain can be overly transparent so this has two effects uh, in one side not everyone is as honest as they want to be uh, so they may not want some information to be shared secondly some information is supposed to be private so for example anything concerning national security that has to be private so some of those systems might not be ideal to be transported into blockchain um so coming over to me personally what i'm doing is i'm building his app which is a blockchain platform uh, where we are uh, doing a lot of projects through this i won't bore everyone with the details um but it has um uh, there's a potential uh, like any blockchain network to go into all of the verticals that uh, we know that blockchain can you know go up with for more details you can visit our website hisapp.pk and that's it uh, uh, i'm open to any questions that anyone has uh thank you sharuk thank you a lot Uh, can you kindly put your uh, uh, slide down sure sir okay thank you so much uh, i think it's a wonderful webinar going on it's going live on facebook so a lot of people are watching you now so anybody who can afford to please uh, be in the camera please be in the camera especially the speakers i can always exempt the uh, ladies but uh, i think uh, anybody uh, anybody who is uh, who is on the video i think uh, is is being recorded being going live so i would like you to be there so uh, now i request dr maria uh, to please uh, take the floor dr maria uh assalam uh, marsu thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to join this group uh this is my first time i'm talking to people um, with such a diverse background and especially with a technology oriented uh, background uh, my specialization and the center specialization is essentially with defense and national security issues uh, the topic which i'll be discussing today is basically belt and road initiative uh, cpac and its connectivity um, and its impact uh, with regards to the blockchain um, challenge it's always difficult to talk after uh, such august speakers have speak has spoken nonetheless uh, given the paucity of time i would like to make uh, three short interventions with regards to what this technology uh, can afford uh, to belt and road uh, initiative and what does it mean for the china pakistan economic corridor when we talk about the actual impact of uh, blockchain technology with when it comes to international transactions or it is almost 1.7 billion dollars which is estimated uh, is a high mark uh, which these technologies would be affording uh, now also and after time as well so what is um, interesting here is to understand that not only does this technology affords us um, a greater capacity to not only interact with each other but also to understand that the primary function in global trade uh, that is uh, linked towards uh, the cost of business and the ease of business is directly connected uh, with the efficiency and the speed with which these transactions can actually occur and uh, the mere fact that blockchain technology takes out the intermediary and provides that uh, affordability not only to state structures but also to private enterprises uh, is perhaps one of the most unique features 
Now coming to the Belt and Road Initiative, what we need to understand at this moment is that the Belt and Road Initiative is now at this moment, the single most uh, economically transformative process underway after the Marshall Plan. And according to the Belt and Road Initiative, almost 91 countries will be participating in that. And if you further uh, break it down, uh, it is linking China's economic zones, especially from Gongzhou, Liangjing, uh, Shanghai um, to Gongzhou, um, to um, at least seven major ports, uh, starting from St. Petersburg, uh, in, uh, then uh, Rotterdam, uh, Paris, um, and Calais. Um, Iran um, from the Khomeini port, and then last but not least uh, for Pakistan, uh, Gawadar in Karachi. Now, the significance of that lies within the fact that it's not just about infrastructure, which has been connected between Pakistan, uh, throughout Pakistan, and then linking it down um, to uh, the seaport. It is to understand the fact that tomorrow, uh, the actual transactions will be happening in the Indian Ocean. And if you look at that, it is uh, believed that at this moment, since 2006, up to now, there has been almost 293% increase in the actual trade volume, which is passing through the Indian Ocean. If you look at the world oil supplies uh, or the oil trade uh, zones, it's almost 90% uh, of the world oil uh, transactions actually pass or shipments actually pass from the Indian Ocean. Almost 25.5% from the state of almost 19.9%. Uh, in the states uh, towards the states of Malacca and are almost 11.1% from the Swiss Canal. And uh, connecting that to the digital silk route, we understand that the digital silk route starts from Gavada, goes down to Djibouti and from Djibouti to Mombasa on one hand. And on the other hand, it comes down from um, Gavada to Djibouti and from Djibouti to Swiss Canal. Uh, so it not only affords for the first time a new economic transaction, but it would be for the first time also providing um, a new supply chain which will be looking at north-south connectivity. So the China-Pakistan economic corridor essentially fills up that gap and brings in uh, that potential, um, which has been unrealized. And the link to that is, of course, uh, the bigger question, uh, which I think is the most unique aspect when it comes to blockchain uh, technologies and their affordability, plus the fact that there will be uh, a sea change in terms of how new businesses will be done. Uh, first and foremost, um, it is uh, consumer sensitive. Um, number two, it is population centric. And number three, that while it gives space to uh, bigger corporations and it gives space to all of those, it also provides access uh, to all those people uh, who have not been, who have not benefited from the financial system um, or from the monetary system, in a, um, and especially in developing countries. For example, in Pakistan, the developing country, as a developing country, only 17.1% of Pakistan's population actually accesses the banking system. But with blockchain technology, uh, one short example, which is uh, prevalent in Pakistan is, for example, Easy Pesa. Although it doesn't reflect all components of blockchain, but it does represent um, a significant shift in terms of consumer access, um, has shown that this technology can very really quickly become um, something not only which would be preferred by the population, but something which would allow for greater trade activity to happen. In this context, uh, what is significant is that while uh, now there is a bigger debate uh, in terms of how states have to respond to it, like all other technologies, in this case also the regulation falls way behind uh, how the technology evolved. Uh, whether in, in terms of individual uh, data users, whether in terms of uh, people who are managing the digital asset management uh, phase of this technology, or uh, those who will be at the receiving end. Uh, the taxation systems, as Amar Sab was, uh, was talking about, um, has uh, unduly focused um, on the technology aspect of it, rather than looking at it in terms of an actual opportunity where technology can actually yield results, can actually uh, bring in that untapped, uh, or uh, in our case, for example, or even in other developing countries, uh, where uh, a lot of untapped revenue, uh, which does not see any digital uh, any, any, any digital mapping uh, could perhaps in future be, could be digitally mapped and could also become part of the state's structure. So at this moment, while uh, the bigger countries such as the United States, Japan, Russia, um, even Venezuela and Estonia have, have looked at uh, coming up with taxation systems and have come up with uh, different regulations, countries like Pakistan need to also very strongly uh, look at not only the regulation, but also look at the security as well as the opportunity which such uh, revolutionary uh, technology will be affording. And it's not something that you'll be the first to start, but it is something which you will have to face 
because the share trade volume which will come to Pakistan as a result of the CPAC uh, will be based in terms of your port connectivity. And if you just look at the port potential, um, Singapore after 30 years of development is, stands around 471 um, MNT. And um, UAE in comparison or Dubai in comparison is around 126 MNT. And if you look at that uh, from Gavadar's point of view, the untapped potential of Gavadar is 400 MNT. And if we uh, further develop it, it will go to around 800 MNT. So this means that the trade volume alone in just one year will, uh, if uh, we do not connect to the sea lines of communication, we just connect and focus only on China, Pakistan economic corridor, would be around $1 trillion, which would be passing through. And if we connect it to the sea lines of communication and the actual trade, which is passing through the Indian Ocean also, we're talking about $3 trillion of trade, which will be passing through. So this is just the uh, trade volume which will be passing. This does not cater or factor in uh, the development of the special economic zones. It does not factor in uh, the development of digital uh, cities which will be there. And uh, linked to that is also the bigger challenge uh, which perhaps this region would be looking at. And that is also um, going to be the stability of the, uh, uh, of the blockchain technology in this region. That is one, energy production. Um, that how are we going to be managing the energy production? Uh, how much share of the energy production will be uh, carried through that? And, and number two, the placement of cloud, uh, you know, uh, technology uh, servers and others, uh, where could they be pla placed? The Himalayas definitely offer one such opportunity. Um, and uh, so this basically means that it's not just about land road connectivity which will be offered uh, through the China Pakistan economic road corridor or through the Belt and Road Initiative if you're talking about 91 plus countries and we're talking about base technologies uh, we can look at uh, different aspects of it um, also in terms of high uh, population and high technology sensitive uh, market availability uh, to also uh, secure placement of such technologies and also sitting at an economically more viable route uh, which can allow for these things to happen. I think one last um, aspect which I would like to talk about uh, in blockchain technologies before I conclude um, is the fact that uh, blockchain technologies, while are focused a lot in terms of cyber connectivity, are focused in terms of how the um, digital silk route uh, will be developing or other uh, lines of communication uh, or the cyber connectivity under the sea uh, would be uh, connected. Along with that, uh, with the sea lines of communication, uh, the most important factor would remain the astropolitics in terms of how the global future satellite connectivity and uh, those positioning would also be uh, used and factored in uh, in terms of providing perhaps uh, the future which will be based around uh, the access to global commons and also developing technology development and uh, an insight um, what I would rather say a foresight uh, to use and adopt these technologies. Because if they are not adopted, then uh, those countries which will be the global pathways will, will be the ones which would be connecting uh, these technologies um, as well as the actual physical market um, and supply of these uh, different goods and services um, to the global market. Uh, if they do not rope themselves in, then someone else would be doing these negotiations for you and, and uh, how that will factor in the interest of almost 22.2 uh, million people in Pakistan, or for that matter, the regional uh, population, which surpasses almost one fifth of the world's humanity, uh, will be a bigger question mark. So while we are talking about um, the potential within Pakistan, the fact remains that after the Belt and Road Initiative and this feedback component, we are going to be talking about global connectivity and we will be talking about global supply chains. Uh, which will require uh, a rethink, um, not only in terms of how we see trade, but also how we see actual transactions between trade services and establishing um, a supply chain, uh, which is not uh, that the battle for um, the surplus value um, is essentially uh, within those who become technology leaders. I think Pakistan affords a very special and a unique position in that. And with, with regards to this, listening to all the blockchain technology developers and those who have been linked to it uh, through this seminar, it's also clear that this is the future which needs to be very seriously dwelt on. 
uh, whether it, in the case of Pakistan, whether it is about uh, election commission using uh, this for electronic voting uh, to the banking uh, systems, to the land registry, uh, we see that already bits and pieces of this technology are already in use, but more needs to be done if we have to truly appreciate the real value of the Belt and Road Initiative, and along with that, uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor as actually the gateway towards technological transformation, trade and connectivity, not only for Pakistan and China, but also for the region. Because unless until there is no win-win uh, there, uh, a win-win solution is not uh, brought in, uh, the net effects of this technology will not be delivered for all. So the future will only depend in terms of how north, south, east, west connectivity builds up and uses these new um, transformative technologies for development and progress, not only for this region, but for the world at large. I thank you all for your uh, uh, time and, uh, and consideration for, for uh, listening to these uh, small interventions. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, Dr. Maria. Wonderful talk. I open up for everybody. Uh, firstly, I would like to request the speakers to please uh, watching, keep on watching the group and the chat so that I can announce the next one. Okay, actually, uh, the next speaker is having some internet problem. So I request the next to next, that is Ahmed Hamadan, to please. I would request the speakers to please introduce them briefly because I can introduce everybody, but I'll take a long time. So just your name, your organization, so that everybody listening to you can, uh, can understand uh, about you. So my friend Ahmed Hamadan, are you there? Okay, uh, actually, a few people have been submitted. Okay, please go ahead, Ahmed Amadan, please go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, uh, Mar, for um, giving me some time on this panel. Um, heard some interesting, thought provoking ideas and concepts, learned so much from the astute speakers that we've had. Uh, and what I'd like to do is introduce a few more things for people to think about. Um, my name is Ahmed Hamdan, and I represent decrypted solutions, right? Uh, but let me talk more about uh, what we're facing today in, in, in the world. How many of you uh, are using digital banking? I'm assuming it's quite a few, right? The, how many of you are participating in global trade? Is the process simple for you? Is it difficult? How many of you wish that it was easier? and say, hey, I have a great idea. I'm gonna make it easier for everybody else. But what do you do about it? Not much. I mean, did you know that the digital currency, uh, dig digital banking right now, right? is simply a manifestation of digitizing an analog process. They simply take what you're doing today uh, in, in a manual process or a paper format and convert it into a digital and call it digital bank, which is, really a, a pretty sad approach, but that's the best they can do from a marketing perspective. Uh, mar marketing and their visions are great, but technology or the implementation hasn't caught up. So only a, truly a few digital banks exist today. Right? We're right now in the midst uh, of an evolution uh, in, in currency as we know it. Um, so my, my, what I'm talking today about is digital currency revolution, uh, staying away from uh, blockchain and uh, the, uh, the implementations, right? So what, what do you do when you're faced with a problem? Most people typically seek a solution. They ask somebody, um, they ask others to help them with it, right? And when many of us are facing the same problem and trying to solve for the same uh, thing, we share our concepts and we try many things. The result is as the dust settles, right? People embrace the path of least resistance. Similarly, embracing a crypto is one such revolution. Many have resisted, thrown curveballs at it and created legislature to prevent it, but mass adoption is happening. It's not easy, but it's happening. Now, many institutions are embracing it as well. Financial institutions are considering it. Uh, regulators are working hard to determine what they can do to regulate and uh, streamline. Re regulators are also creating their own version of it. Uh, there's, uh, uh, there's talk from uh, The Economist uh, magazine this week. There's, they talk about uh, you know, uh, central bank coin. 
Swift is being challenged. Uh, Swift is the uh, global network for financial movements, right? Russia is working on an alternative to Swift right now, as we speak. They want to uh, not not destabilize, but they want to say, "Hey, you know what? They they want to take away the monopoly of uh, Swift." Uh, so many countries right now are looking into how to embrace revolutionary currency. Emerging from it is a new form of currency called central bank digital currency. Central banks are working on pilot projects today to determine the best approach and are developing new policy as well around central bank digital currency. Um, concept papers are available through your favorite consulting firms or IMF. Uh, many central banks are working on it today. Some of the more prominent ones that you might want to uh, look into are uh, or, or having pilot projects are China. Uh, Japan launched it in, I believe, uh, March and they have a year long pilot program going. Uh, some African countries are looking into it as well. Uh, in, the, in the last few months, uh, Central Bank of the United States has been uh, focused on it, has uh, had a lot of dialogues, um, but right now what they're trying to define, what, what they have to first define is how are they going to uh, define uh, digital currency? Is it an asset class? Is it uh, a trading commodity? Um, they have to get uh, IRS as well as uh, uh, central bank to figure out, you know, how they're going to define it before they can uh, approach it. Um, today, I want to understand, uh, or what I'm studying right now is how many people have digital wallets. If you're using a um, digitized version of your banking application, you have a digital wallet in your hand, right? The way, you, uh, the way we use money will change the next few months if it hasn't changed already. Pakistan today is moving towards digital financial reforms. Central bank digital currency is a mandate by state bank by the year 2025. What are we doing about it? So many opportunities. We, we, many of us talk about it and say, hey, well, here are the opportunities, here, here are the Silk Road uh, uh, opportunities, but what are we doing about it? Right? Academic as well as vision has to come to re reality. We, we have to get some commercial uh, linkages into this and ensure we build something before it's too late. Otherwise, we're gonna to have to adopt what somebody else has. Um, SECP has taken an approach, they're considering crowd financing and has a sandbox for it today. Uh, State Bank has taken an initiative, EMI licenses are now ratified and passed the sandbox stage. So we are in the midst of a global financial reform, uh, storm, right? Uh, this is an opportunity to watch from the bleachers or do something about it. Where do you stand? What do you wanna do? If there are questions, um, you know, I'm glad to help and answer. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Madan. You're always very kind, very kind always, of the smiling face and giving a candy talks. Actually, ladies and gentlemen, me and Madan are very good friends also for the last so many years, and we have been lobbying all of all what you are seeing here today. Okay, thank you, Madan. Thank you. So, thank you, guys. Uh, please. Uh, you want to say anything, Amadan? Okay. No, no, I said thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks for setting up an amazing show. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Amadan. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Bushra to please uh, take the floor. Dr. Bushra. Asalaamu Alaikum, can you hear me? Yeah, very clear, please go ahead. Okay. So I'm Bushra and I'm representing here uh, Block, Block Venters. So Block Venters is basically the uh, blockchain-based specialized company so here today i just uh, i am just targeting a specialized topic which is uh, my permission blockchain so let me just uh, uh, let me just uh, share my screen just give me one minute please go ahead you can share your screen no issue okay just give me one second nisha you want to say anything Nisha, you want to say anything? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, very clear. Please go sir, sir, please give me an opportunity for two minutes because I would like to share the interlinking between blockchain okay, okay. and industrial. Okay. You, industrial you, you'll, get it. you'll get it in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please, Nisha, go ahead. 
please go ahead. Okay, so permission blockchain. So first we need to understand what the difference between uh, a permission blockchain and what is permissionless blockchain. As we all know about Ethereum, Bitcoin, these all are permissionless blockchain, not permission. So what blockchain offers for uh, businesses? So businesses, in businesses, like uh, let me just share the agenda for today. So first we need to understand why uh, blockchain is offered permission blockchain for businesses. As we all know that in businesses, we need privacy. Like uh, they don't, businesses don't want they to share their uh, business transactions with a third party or unknown people. So blockchain offers a permission blockchain. So let's uh, first understand what is permission blockchain. So for understanding, I just uh, put an image here. Here you can see the two types of uh, blockchain, high level types of blockchain. So first is a uh, public blockchain and second enterprise blockchain. So let's uh, focus on enterprise blockchain here. So here we, are, here we have a uh, private blockchain and consortium blockchain. In private blockchain, only one organization put their all data on the blockchain. So on consortium blockchain, a group of organizations uh, just uh, come together and just make a blockchain network. Only in consortium network, only some um, known identities could join the network and this permission is required to read and write the data in this uh, uh, consortium blockchain. So uh, here, um, I think uh, just, uh, this is the, some kind of uh, network blockchain as I just tell, tell you. So um, here I just, uh, uh, some, I just write some uh, areas of blockchain. So enterprise grade applications areas. So uh, here first come is uh, supply chain. So how blockchain impact on uh, supply chain? So first we need to understand the challenges current uh, supply chain is, uh, is facing. So increased cost throughout the supply chain, supply chain complexity due to multiple channels to market. And the third one is com consumer demand uh, drive need to improve speed, quality and service. And also another main uh, thing is the risk in the supply chain create pressure on the businesses. So how blockchain is going to solve these uh, supply chain issues? Supply, uh, supply chain in blockchain, blockchain offers us to end-to-end -end tracking. Also, is it improves the uh, traceability. Also, by using blockchain, we can, uh, or we can track the origin of a product, like uh, the previous speakers uh, uh, told, uh, told us about food supply chain, IBM food supply chain, by using that, blockchain we are we can just track the origin of the product of a food product so second is transportation payment and distribute dis, uh, dispute resolution so this is the main um, I, if we talk about cpac so this is the main area i just find uh, find out for you to just focus on it that what are the current challenges faced by transportation uh, transportation and dis, uh, distribute resolution <clears throat> So every day there are almost 140 billion, uh, 140 billion dollar tied up in distributes for payments in the transportation industry. For an average invoice, a company must wait almost 42 days before receiving payments. So many businesses have millions of dollars tied up in their accounts, which they could be using to advance their businesses, improve delivery times, and better service and users. So what? blockchain impact uh, is in the transportation industry. So what we can do with the blockchain technology in transportation with the help of blockchain technology, none of these issues would exist to nearly the same degree. How? By using the blockchain for data authentication, the entire network can contribute and validate the data and it is no longer subject to tampering. Increased reliability of tracking information can also have an impact in conversation of goods being shipped. So let me give you just an example. Refrigerated and temperature controlled transportation relies on, on time delivery. This efficiency is only improved with the blockchain. So uh, third I, uh, idea is uh, personal identities. So uh, in, the in the supply chain especially, we have the problem of identities like we have to trust on unknown parties like suppliers and other parties. So, what if uh, all the data, I mean, uh, suppliers' personal data are on the blockchain 
and when someone uh, verify the identity of this supply chain supplier so he just go to the blockchain and just verify through a qr code or some hash keys he just he just verify the uh, uh, he just verify the uh, he just verify the identity of supplier either is authentic or not so uh, only by using blockchain this is possible that anyone we can trust third parties and third uh, we can trust the unknown parties so fourth and the main uh, uh, use case of blockchain in uh, enterprise grade blockchain is partnership management and agreements so as you all, as we all know that collaboration is the heart of business life but this is not easy in real life however successful collaboration does not come easily your partners may lay commitment they can change the contract they have the option so we are not sure about the these agreements so any other uh, problems like uh, they can change the agreement terms and this will create a lot of problem so what if we have the these all these agreements on the blockchain in tamper proof form there were no parties can change the data we can just uh, if someone wants to change obviously blockchain will not allow to change the, the data so all agreements will be on the blockchain in the immutable form so uh, uh, this would be this would increase this partnership agreement more easy and more uh, scalable also so uh, that's it from my side so any question uh thank you can can you can you bring down your head please Uh, yeah let me just uh, down here okay is uh, miss bisma back bisma are you there okay uh there there's some uh, communication problem with bisma uh so now uh let, let, let me see uh dr kasra are you there dr kasra okay uh yes i'm there i'm there is good thank you please go ahead Dr. Kesha, can you listen to me? Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I want to present some uh, slides. I just need to check how can I share. Uh, can you can you please uh, introduce, introduce yourself? Mm -hmm. Every speaker. Every speaker. So, uh, um, how can I share my slides? Uh, screen share is there. You can share it easily. Go to your desktop and just click the button. You you can share it. I'm on the desktop. Wherever in the folder your slide is, you can go there. Just click it, and you are there. Okay. Ma'am, you're okay. gonna click on the share content, and then you will be selecting the slide. I'm just gonna. Yes, you are there now. Please go ahead. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Kesra Fazil. i am uh, working in blockchain technology since couple of years of course uh, um, everyone is talking about block bitcoin and other cryptocurrency which is a first use case of uh, blockchain technology and uh, all of uh, other participants uh, my dear colleagues they have already explained about the blockchain technology its importance and its applications and uh, since today uh, our topic was silk road and uh, the cpec so i uh, come up with this some uh, solution uh, some uh, project which is based on production of green energy and the application of blockchain technology in token economy and uh, establishing a token based on blockchain technology for green energy so is my uh, screen is already shared or 
Is it's it shared? shared. Yeah. yeah, we can mm -hmm. see it. Please go ahead. Okay, moment. I just have to scroll down. So, um, but I just uh, there's a there are uh, now nowadays uh, most of the time we are focused on fuel. Uh, the fuel that we are using in mobility sector is uh, fossil fuel, and uh, of course uh, all these transactions and all these uh, logistics and CPEC is mainly based on mobility. Can you hear me? Hello. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Everybody yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, the reason uh, there is a big challenge in this existing fuel system, which is uh, uh, the cost, stability in the cost and availability of the fuel, then somehow we are uh, mainly, most of the time, we are being sanctioned and there are different issues that uh, always create a problem uh, when we are dealing with uh, mobility sector. And of course, if there is a uh, vehicles, there must be fuel without fuel, nothing is gonna happen. So uh, the, the problem for us was normally that in electric uh, existing system, we are not only uh, leaving footprint, uh, carbon dioxide footprints, but we are all, we are all, uh, since we are starting the new system, the CPAC, it's a completely a new infrastructure developing trading system. And in that case, if we start with the, uh, in, in order to ex uh, existing uh, system, we can add some additional features, additional um, uh, energy sectors, which is based on um, hydrogen, which is uh, the hydrogen. When I uh, talk to you uh, about hydrogen, this is a fuel, which is three times more powerful than the standard um, uh, fuel. And it's uh, um, hydrogen can contribute to a 24% of the final energy demand and 60, 650 million of tons of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide uh, reduction. So there are different type of, uh, nowadays we, we are uh, uh, very much uh, familiar with electric vehicles, which are also uh, being a source of uh, uh, using the green energy, but electric vehicles are cannot be used for long-term uh, distance. So why we are using hydrogen? Because it's most commonly available uh, element in the world. And this is a key energy source. And the most important thing why uh, hydrogen is important, energy cannot be stored. You cannot transfer energy from uh, from one place to the other. So hydrogen is the only source in which we can store the energy. When our grid stations, they are, uh, uh, we need to uh, reduce, uh, balance the create the balance in energy in uh, incoming and outgoing energy. We have to uh, have some system where we can store the energy. We are we are wasting a lot of energy uh, when we shut down the grids. So if we have a proper systematic way where we can store this energy and this energy later on can be utilized not only for household stuff, but also for uh, mobility sector, this is a great application for hydrogen. But I just want to give a very small uh, brief that hydrogen in a, uh, vehicles, here so you can see there are some applications of hydrogen uh, vehicles in the system. There are hydrogen trains, hydrogen uh, ships, cars, trucks, especially long-term distance. We uh, uh, nor normally in Japan, nowadays Japan, China, in Asia, I'm talking about Asia, Japan, China, Europe, and US, and different other countries, now they are moving to hydrogen because this is uh, cost-effective. Of course, initially installation of the infrastructure takes uh, is a one-time um, investment, but then on long-term, it's uh, cost-effective. And here we can see, just for an example, that uh, the this um, they have the, the guy he has in um, he has traveled 400 uh, total 49 kilometer. He displayed he he traveled in, in this Hyundai. He has traveled uh, uh, three times 778 kilometer, and that could be that is three times more than the normal fuel. And he, uh, because when we use hydrogen as a fuel, the outcome is only uh, water. So we are purifying not only, uh, we are not only use, uh, saving the uh, money, but we are also purifying the climate. And so here you can see uh, in a simple way, the normal trucks, a bus, they can uh, travel 43 kilometer. And 
with the uh, hydrogen fuel, they can travel 350 kilometers, having the same pricing. And uh, similarly, we are using uh, uh, this for other aviation industry and also for hydrogen refueling. And the installation of hydrogen refueling station is not a very co uh, complicated structure. We, we need a very small place for installation of fuel stations. And how can we produce? Because uh, initially it's very uh, not, I should say that it's apparently it's a new technology for Pakistan. But since in Pakistan, we have sun energy. We, have, we can produce it with the solar energy. We can use wind energy. And if we install these fuel stations on the way to hold the CPEC, we are uh, not uh, going to use fuel, uh, uh, this fossil fuel. And we are not only saving the climate, but we are also saving the uh, investments. And there are um, other applications I can just for green. And here is, you can see it's just in, on this slide, there are um, um, hydro mobility subsidized and prioritized government is uh, different governments in a different level. They are uh, giving the subsidies for the hydrogen fuels, which uh, pay, uh, I believe inshallah in next uh, couple of years, Pakistan is also going to participate in that because China is also a big player in this hydrogen sector. And in this collaboration, definitely they will uh, partner with each other. And now how can uh, road to the green Pakistan for a quick change to clean energies, we recommend the following scenario. The combination of waste removals and production of green hydrogen is very efficient way to implement quick solution. We can produce green hydrogen from waste and from wa these waste materials, we, have, uh, we can uh, manage, uh, use our waste management. And besides, we can also produce synthetic fuels. We can also produce uh, use us at small um, uh, domestic level. We can use the hydrogen, and this all. And also, we can use the mobile mobile fuel stations. Why I took this topic uh, on the blockchain because my concern is to establish an ecosystem based on blockchain technology where we can use our token system. We can use a token economy. Uh, we can establish a blockchain technology based uh, to, uh, system, uh, an ecosystem where we can, uh, where currently I'm working on a project in which we are developing a trading platform for energy. This, trade, what this trading platform is doing, we have our own uh, token. I am saying that now in Pakistan, we are going to have our own token. Uh, this token is used for uh, like, it's a hybrid token like Binance. We can use as a utility to buy the fuel. We, we have uh, in next couple of uh, days, and I'm also going to uh, uh, make some collaboration. I'm looking for some uh, high authorities, officials in Pakistan that we can make some uh, collaboration for international organizations who are producing the hydrogen of mobility, mobile fuel stations, where we can install these fuel stations and these fuel stations uh, are on trucks and different uh, mobiles. And they can, we can see that the, where is the flow of the, um, um, these vehicles, the, uh, this fuel, fuel uh, station can move there. And on the blockchain technology system on the app, we, uh, a user can see that uh, uh, where is the fuel available, how much is the price of the fuel at that, and can, and can I uh, book the fuel at as early as possible? Okay, it's like an Uber system. It's like an Uber system for uh, blockchain technology based, transparent, and we, we will have our own token, own economy. So we are not dependent on any, anyone else. So this is uh, this is how it, this will be a P2P, uh, P2P trading platform for open for hydrogen market participants, and it's a distributed ledger and smart contract will ensure the certification of green energy, and payment method is green hybrid token, and uh, what how uh, the what will be the target market, and this can be I'm this I'm using at, I'm doing it as the uh, local level but we can enhance at the government level. Government can use it as a government uh, at a uh, token as it's their own economy to enhance the economy. Because we are talking about blockchain, but the best application of blockchain technology is the token, tokenization. When we can uh, tokenize any project, any asset, this is where I can see uh, the infrastructure, the financial benefits of the uh, blockchain technology. So we need to now also focus on the token economy 
to uh, tokenize our existing assets. We have Manjadoro, we have different other assets which we can tokenize and we can go for that. We, uh, many people, most of you are now uh, very much familiar with NFTs and other uh, tokens. So my uh, objective today was to bring a new, uh, this sector into this uh, inform into your, into your knowledge that how we can use our existing infrastructure and establish our own fuel system without depending on other countries because we are blessed pakistan is blessed with uh, sun pakistan is we have so, um, more sun in 24 by 7 i should say in different regions we are going to have sun energy that we can use in solar panels we can also use waste management we can also use wind energy to establish a complete new infrastructure we can have definitely if we are ready we are definitely can have a good investments from international investors and using this we can and then at the next the first thing is establishment of the infrastructure next stage is the development of uh, transformation of this infrastructure onto the blockchain technology to establish a token economy and this is what i am more interested in. and uh, i would uh, like to thank you all of you for uh, taking time thank you very much long live pakistan thank you much <clears throat> can you can you bring down your presentation i will share it with you I'm going to share it with you. No, no. Can you bring down your presentation? Just uh, okay. I I can just uh, like this. Is stop sharing. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Uh, here. Okay. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is a very valuable person for me, Mr. David. Mr. David is an amazing person. And we are working together on a number of international projects on blockchain. And uh, David has really offered us something which is very exciting for me. And I've, I've, it's a proud honor for me to announce that uh, David and one of his colleagues, they have offered to work on Urdu blockchain. You know, he's talking about smart contracts, actually are already working on smart contracts. But since Urdu is also on a Unicode, so we are discussing that how we can bring our traditional legal system that is all contracts written in Urdu into uh, and bring them a smart contract and link them with blockchain. Over to you, David, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Amma Jeffrey. And uh, welcome, everyone, from London, um, early in the morning here today. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of uh, Lexon, which is a, a, a fabulous project where we've been working for a number of years on um, the internet of agreement. So that's really blockchain um, smart contracts, uh, but applied in a legal context. So um, as many of the um, um, previous speakers have alluded to, there's um, huge potential for transformation of everyday uh, business, everyday life um, using blockchain, internet of things, um, transforming green economy, transforming finance, uh, even democracy itself. And this is gonna have a, a profound impact on the world, uh, particularly um, um, in, in Pakistan, um, um, and the uh, Belt and Road Initiative and the global transformations that are happening. Um, obviously, this scale of transformation at this speed um, uh, with all these devices and all these organizations across borders uh, interacting with each other is incredibly complex. And um, there are a lot of risks associated with uh, failures or breakdowns in uh, these agreements and the technology underpinning them and the agreements. And while blockchain offers um, huge advantages in terms of security, transparency, and robustness um, of the decentralized architecture that the, the technology permits, it still is the case that these technologies are complex. And whenever you have a, a complex system, there are many points of failure. And there's another important point about blockchain that is, um, 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 uh, key to both its adoption and its use in practice. And uh, that is um, the trust in the technology and its robustness in law. So um, what I'll show you here briefly, I'm not gonna spend a long time uh, if I can, um, maybe it's worth sharing, um, is um, uh, what a, a, a um, smart contract looks like um, uh, in, 
conventional blockchain language. So here we have a, a smart contract. It's a very simple, I'm not going to go into it, but it's actually a very simple piece of code that implements an escrow contract. And the problem is that this, for the majority of people, is unreadable. And there could be things in this code, which I'm not really prepared to agree in, but um, I'm being convinced that to enter into agreement of something I don't understand. And this is not a, a meeting of minds. This is not, um, therefore, a legally binding agreement. And this offer, offers uh, an extra hole for um, a lack of trust between the parties and um, a, an extra point of failure in which people can claim they never entered into that agreement and therefore opens up the agreement to legal challenge. And this is what um, basically um, the, the language, the blockchain language that we've been working on for a number of years now um, does, because this language is a language which is both, and I'm gonna just do a two minute demo here of a, a, a version that we worked on over a year ago now. Um, we're currently refactoring that for the um, second generation of this language. But this is, language is a language with, which you can write in natural language. Um, so we can localize it to any language in the world. Um, we've done it naturally in English to begin with, but also in Japanese. And um, we're very keen and interested in working with Blockchain Center of Pakistan to do it in Urdu. Um, so what this language allows us to do, and uh, this editor, if I just paste code onto the um, left here, um, uh, and uh, this code that I'm pasting automatically generates the solidity contract on the right. It also can compile down to several other languages. If you have a look at this code, um, this code here, if I maybe just simplify it here, um, this is uh, just says it's electron code and it says, it just defines some concepts, payer as a person, pay as an amount, uh, fee as an amount and, and so forth. Uh, something that anyone can understand. And this we're proposing doing in um, Urdu, uh, working together with lawyers and coders to uh, port the uh, language so that you can write your contracts, your smart contracts in Urdu, um, as well as English. And um, um, this therefore stands up in a court of law. A judge can read this, this language has been crafted and needs to be crafted. It's called a constrained language in such a way that a judge can say, yes, you've agreed, you've signed this contract and it's understandable and the terms are clear. Um, so in this case, you've got uh, the language says the payer pays an amount into escrow, appoints the payee, appoints the arbiter and also fixes the fee. That's the essence of an escrow contract. If you compare that to the solidity on the left here, which is unintelligible to anyone apart from a programmer, let alone a judge or the party signing it or a contract in uh, Sophia, you can see the power of creating code, which is both automatable, that's a smart contract, and a legally binding agreement between parties. Um, and the power of doing that um, in the, um, uh, the, the context of, uh, of, of, of Pakistan is to basically um, simplify, make more robust and make more transparent. That is democratize um, the legal agreements, the internet of agreements that is the future basis of trade and commerce across the world. And to leapfrog, if you like, the antiquated systems, um, placing the control in the hands of not coders, not big multinational companies, because this is a free open source language that um, um, uh, anyone can write their contracts in, make agreements with other parties, and yet robustly scale these um, um, in a way which is far more secure than anything that mankind has used before. Um, and we're very keen on piloting uh, this language, developing this language together with the Blockchain Center of Pakistan, um, and um, looking for application areas. The last thing I'd like to say about the power of uh, the transparency and the democratization of uh, legal uh, contracts is that in a, in a business, in a, in, a, in a time of history in which technology is transforming all our lives this quickly, um, it is important not to, if you like, put all your eggs into any particular piece of technology which will doubtless 
transform itself and uh, be out of date within um, a couple of years, you know, four years maximum. And um, definitely blockchain languages and the code bases that are being developed for them will rapidly age. One of the advantages of expressing the complex nature of human agreements in um, legal language, in an understandable human-centered language, uh, that you use compiler technology to compile down to whatever blockchain language comes um, is made available in the future as you future proof all that hard work you do with communities with businesses with uh, legislatures and, and and so forth and um, uh, when you're really looking at the future of uh, languages that human beings use um, uh, for uh, global commerce and for regional uh, trade as well um, you want to make sure that all that slow, painful work in terms of gaining trust, adoption, and making those agreements, very complex agreements between parties, which is very context, locally uh, um, um, dependent, um, that work is done in a future-proofed way. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, David. <clears throat> this is a great offer. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, along with the CPAC offering the uh, Urdu content system, I think this is something going very amazing. So maybe the next webinar we will have only on this, uh, uh, having some legal contests which is blockchain enabled in Urdu. Thank you, my dear. I will get back to you. Okay, our next speaker is Mr. Ali Zain. Ali Zain, please over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Zain. Dr. Kesha, please unmute yourself. Dr. Kesha, please unmute yourself. Dr. Kesha, please unmute yourself. Basically, I would uh, like to uh, put some light on a few core use cases that I really want in uh, the industry and the academia to focus on uh, in order to uh, bring in some useful use cases into uh, the growth of the technology as well as the technology and as well as solving uh, the core uh, use cases. So uh, first of all, in, in context of uh, FATF, uh, that is affecting the Pakistani exports and, and uh, the ease of doing business in Pakistan, um, I would rather like to put in the point that we would actually, actually really need to move quickly into uh, automating the EKYC and AML part uh, uh, and uh, automating the validation verification process through the blockchain network because uh, peop, uh, already many of the many of the major countries that are flourishing are already implementing it through blockchain and we really actually need to expedite ourselves you know and bring bringing in the regulatory bodies to uh, ensure that we automate the verification and validation process of the of the of the of the, of the, of the Business people to ensure the seamless process of uh, getting the money in and uh, increasing the uh, what's called the foreign reserve of the country. So uh, basically, this has been a big hurdle uh, at, uh, at our part, which we uh, need to cater as, as soon as possible. So um, this is my first point, and we are really uh, striving hard and uh, trying to bring in many, uh, talking to many different bodies in Pakistan, like banks and. Uh, other like SCP. So, uh, so basically, uh, I would actually like to say that uh, we have to uh, move fast into this and bring in the uh, EKYC model for uh, automating this process and bringing in the ease of business. So that's my actually my first proposal. And I would actually like to add your input as well because we are doing extensive research on it 
and want to bring in the best solutions and present it to the regulatory bodies from our part. Um, along with that, uh, as we are we are a growing agricultural country, and uh, we really need to add, we are exporting in agriculture. So uh, I would really uh, want everyone to actually think around the lines of uh, doing uh, agri-tech based supply chain automation to ensure the transparency and the quality of the product that we are actually giving to the uh, giving to the, uh, exporting globally. So uh, for that matter, we have to actually come up with uh, good use cases for every exporting agricultural food that we are uh, giving to the world to ensure and actually make the quality of the product transparent. Uh, so for that matter, we are uh, actually collaborating with one of the, one of our uh, partners in Mexico who have uh, been uh, working on uh, uh, what's smart farm, and uh, we are trying to implement a small use case to actually ensure that their users, their, their end users, are getting the quality product uh, through our uh, through ensuring that all the stakeholders are involved in the application and they are entering their uh, relevant quality checks that they are they are uh, utilizing. Uh, using to uh, uh, ensure that the product is being delivered on time and with quality. So, so I really wanted to bring that as a as a as a as a note to uh, uh, for the for the people of Pakistan because uh, we are we are we want to grow next course for agriculture and we want to ensure that the best product is going out of our country uh, to different uh, global markets. Uh, along with that, I would uh, really suggest that uh, as WTO has suggested to move things to, uh, what you can say, different, uh, for automating the trade, trade they are actually uh, advising all the all the trade organizations, big trade organizations to move their uh, supply chain cycle towards blockchain. So we would actually suggest that we would actually need to go to uh, setting up the R, R trading mechanism over the blockchain uh, solution to actually, what you can say, be compatible to the world data for uh, for the for the trading asset. So uh, based on that, that's a pretty, uh, pretty uh, what you can say, uh, what I would say that we should really expedite ourselves to uh, bring in the systems to actually be compatible to the world data of uh, of, of, of trading information. Uh, so that in the case of EPAC, we are uh, we are being part of the network rather than being uh, left behind uh, as, a, as, a, as a as a data structure approach. Um, and the fourth major industry that I really want to put focus on is real estate real estate tokenization. Uh, I think in Pakistan is the most common mode, it's the most uh, trusted mode of investment all over uh, in our country and people uh, really feel that it's safe to uh, put in money into real estate to gain major profit. So uh, we really want uh, what you can say the, the, the SCCP and the FPR to actually look into this mm -hmm. to see uh, what maximum uh, level of tokenization and regulation can be achieved uh, in this regard to actually tokenize the best assets are being considered in, 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 the, in the region. And uh, we actually want that uh, all the things uh, be put at one place so that there is no issues in regulation because of course the regulation has to be taken care of in this aspect as a major major money inflows and outflows are being carried out to it. So uh, would really suggest that we should really come up as an industry and as a country, uh, we should be uh, putting up things forward to uh, make it a one circle and uh, for example, we should actually, in the real estate, of course, we need micro-level investors to actually come in as well. So for that matter, we can actually tokenize uh, the, in, uh, the investment cycle for uh, for the micro-level investors. And along with that, we can actually automate the rental process, which is also a hassle in our country because of, uh, what you can say, uh, or because of the banking system and micro-payments, we can actually automate the rental process through the blockchain as an architecture. So I think there is a lot of room uh, as, as a country, we should really need to think of uh, in, a, in a more global way and how world is transforming uh, through this 
technology and uh, things like uh, in the in this specific sector. So uh, I thank you all for uh, giving me time to speak in such a uh, great environment and such great speakers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marvin. Thank you, Lizan. Thank you. Uh, Assembly, are you there? Sam Lee can hear us. Yes, yes, I am. So please, I think it's your turn now. Ladies and gentlemen, Sam Lee, we are proud honored to have him with us. He is the CEO of the Global Blockchain Center. He's a good friend. Sam, over to you, please. I, I'll be thankful if you can Sam, have your welcome. window. Sam. Hey, Sam, welcome. <laughs> we can't hear you, Sam. Sam, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yes, how about now? How about yeah, now? Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Um, let me just set this up. Hello, everyone. How are we today? Just fine. Just fine. Please go ahead. So, um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you again, uh, Amar, for the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Sam Lee. Uh, founder and CEO of Blockchain Global and also the founder of the not-for-profit Blockchain Centre in Melbourne. Uh, so we established ourselves back in 2014 uh, to assist the regulators in Australia to build out the first um, tax law for this industry. Uh, because if you talk about blockchain uh, to any government regulator, uh, they will understand it's a great technology, but uh, they don't understand how uh, in the short to medium term this could convert to um, real benefit for the broader public. So, um, as we know, uh, cryptocurrencies is uh, a new um, a value exchange mechanism for people to create and exchange uh, uh, a new form of asset in a decentralized ecosystem. So naturally through this process of increasing the velocity of capital, uh, we noticed that um, there are uh, some players in the space who have done incredibly well. And when they do incredibly well, um, the government needs to get a slice of that. So um, 2014 was, Australia, was when Australia recognized uh, digital currencies as part of the balance sheet. And what that means is traditional capital markets um, uh, from the uh, you know, uh, equities world can participate in uh, this space by investing in blockchain enabled listed companies. Uh, as finally you're able to put uh, assets such as Bitcoin on the balance sheet. So um, uh, since then, we've been over the last eight years educating many governments around the world, including Pakistan. Um, uh, you know, it was a great pleasure in 2019 to also meet Imran Khan to drive the conversation on regulating this industry. Um, as, as we firmly believe that regulation needs to come before innovation, um, as innovation is... Uh, um, too risky in this industry as we are dealing with, uh, of course, uh, the people's money and not just information. Uh, so uh, um, what we're now, uh, uh, what we're now working on post COVID is building out our exchange footprint um, off the back of uh, the successful regulation that has landed in this industry um, as shareholder of some of the largest exchanges in the industry, such as Binance and Bobby, we're perfectly positioned uh, to bring projects to um, uh, the ecosystem and help them uh, uh, access funding and uh, also um, access new markets. Uh, so uh, that's, that said, what we'd like to uh, further collaborate with um, because there cannot be a tax outcome. There cannot be, um, you know, a a, a uh, vehicle for uh, people to capitalize from this new way of creating and exchanging value without, um, you know, the tax ruling. Uh, is we want to keep working with Amar, as well as your team here, to continue um, uh, driving the regulatory narrative so that uh, we could uh, help uh, Pakistani. Um, 
startups as well as uh, uh, entities to uh, leverage this new form of capital raising and consensus building. So um, just a very quick story because uh, as you might know, um, uh, this uh, whole cryptocurrency thing has been going a little bit crazy lately. Um, and it's um, actually very different to 2017 in the fact that um, uh, things such as Dogecoin, which is um, a uh, which was created in under two hours as a joke, uh, now sits at a market cap of uh, larger than some of the Fortune 500 listed companies. Uh, why is this so? Uh, well, it's just uh, through this new mechanism of consensus building, people are able to participate in a decentralized way. So uh, the reason why um, uh, the largest um, cryptocurrencies are actually from uh, well-regulated jurisdictions such as Australia, Singapore, or Switzerland, you know, uh, is because uh, the founders have uh, a safety net uh, knowing that they could issue this new uh, value, uh, create a token economy, and um, bring people on board, uh, um, knowing full safe that they are doing everything within the um, uh, framework of uh, their legal jurisdiction. So if there is no uh, regulation, then uh, we will have the next generation of young, smart Pakistani entrepreneurs going abroad to better regulated jurisdictions to issue their tokens and creating um, this new form of value um, with, with uh, nothing but their uh, two hands and um, and the smarts. So, so uh, for us to ensure that um, this opportunity is kept within Pakistan, a regulation must follow. And uh, uh, you know, God willing, hopefully, we'll be able to achieve that together very soon. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sam. Thank you a lot. You're always. Um... Uh, always very inspiring and very encouraging. Thank you. Uh, uh, Maria, Maria, can you please mute yourself? Okay. Um, Sam has been to Pakistan and he had a meeting with Mr. Imran Khan, the Prime Minister. And I had the proud honor of uh, meeting him immediately after that and we discussed a lot of things. So, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a very rewarding evening, uh, sorry, morning in Pakistan. And uh, if anybody has questions, yeah, Nisha Mali. You know, Nisha has been a great help and support to me. And Nisha, two to three minutes to you in the end. Nisha, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Amar Saab. My name is Nisha Ahmed Malik, and I started as an attorney six months back with Amar Saab. And when I came to his office, I had an education of 16 years in my hand, but I didn't know what is the technical knowledge. And once again, I'll be thankful to Amar Saab. Actually, I was in my village, so I didn't take the responsibility of moderations today because the internet over here fluctuates. But uh, with him, I'm working as the chief operating officer for the IRA Academy. So IRA is basically the industrial revolution 4.0 and blockchain. So while going through different articles, I'm always reading about what is IR 4.0 and how we can interlink them. So one day I got to a very good sentence and I had that in my mind that emerging and foundational technologies such as IoT, cloud, AI, robotics, and blockchain are driving industry 4.0. Means these are the driving forces that are bringing industrial revolution 4.0 by, secure uh, by securing the trust of the people. They are transferring value and storing data blockchain that will help in the automation processes and remove any manual activities. What Pakistani industry mainly lacks is the automation processes and the sincerity in the linking of different things. And I believe that blockchain has been one of the fundamental pillars of industrial revolution 4.0 because that's a base for it when we will have 
blockchain linked with industrial revolution 4.0 and i believe that by adopting the vision of industry 4.0 many industrial sectors are eyeing the potential for advancing their systems to achieve higher productivity cost effectiveness reliability quality and flexibility and one more important sector that can greatly benefit from this is the basic industry and the manufacturing industry and pakistan has a lot of manufacturing in uh, industries who can just in this era they can advance their technologies and enhance the processes of manufacturing uh, the value chain and increase efficiency and prof uh, profitability because what is industrial revolution 4.0 it's basically four processes that come from the raw materials then the production then supply chain and the customer feedback till now we lack in the customer feedback but we hope that in the future or in the near future we'll have a good customer feedback that if the customer likes it why does it like it and if it's not uh, up to the mark then what was the reason that our product was not up to the mark so keeping in mind these things the industrial revolution needs to design a value chain or a value stream in which they have a target if we are achieving the target or the industry manufacturing industry or any of the processes is achieving the target then we are on up to the mark but if we are lacking behind then we need to improve some things in that so that we meet the requirements of the value stream that's been designed to get the proper profits what we need so basically the industry 4.0 requires effective integration of many technologies and system and seamless operations across all components this increases um, many challenges for the applications like smart manufacturing may security we have an issue trust we have an issue traceability reliability agreement automation within the uh, things but several of these challenges which we face in industrial revolution can be addressed using blockchain so blockchain and industrial revolution 4.0 are linked somewhere so the what we need is that we need a middleware approach for utilizing blockchain services and capabilities to enable more secure trustable and reliable system of manufacturing ap applications so this will enable a very variety of new applications i mean to realize the promising benefits of industry uh, 4.0 resulting in very good um, you can say industries in pakistan that can increase the export they can generate employment and one of the biggest challenge which industry 4.0 has addressed is that they don't need a highly automated machinery but they need skilled workforce who has the understanding how to operate this machinery so at last i would love to say that blockchain technology will become a fundamental pillar of industry revolution 4.0 in implementing blockchain the global manufacturing landscape will grow to become more agile and more productive as the community embraces an interconnected distributed ecosystem that maintains the trust of the ownership and people are more reliable and they are more trustworthy and the buyers are even a uh, happy on things as i mentioned before that everything in industry revolution 4.0 we must say that they, these things are interlinked and what i mean to say is that people have different standards the best quality the lowest quality and the qualities will even be addressed by the machines so this is all from my side what i had a little understanding of blockchain and industry revolution 4.0 and i think i was the youngest or maybe the least knowledgeable speaker but thank you very much amar sir for giving me the opportunity to speak thank you thank you nisha thank you a lot ladies and gentlemen uh, this has been a very very rewarding session and i think everyone has learned a lot out of it uh, I, we are actually over overshooting our time so i think i can take one or two question uh, right aman you have some question right aman okay uh to my understanding now if we can link the supply chain with blockchain which is the diverse subject i think we are hitting on the right target and as sam lee has said that pakistan has not only to 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 make blockchain developers and blockchain regulatory and infrastructure for pakistan also but for the entire world also 
Ladies and gentlemen, we have been a wonderful man for exporting country in 70s, but now is the era of 20s now. So we have to we have to build the capacity of our universities, our organizations to to prepare the future leaders of the world. And I think we can do all of us can do amazing job. So uh, I actually our next milestone is 14th of August, and you all know very well that we delivered accident in on 23rd of March when we said blockchain on 21st century Silk Road. So please stay tuned for at least three webinars, at least three webinars on different topics. Uh, we have a very meaningful group now. So with all my speakers, I'll be discussing uh, that what these three this, uh, webinars should cover so that on 14th of August, which is very amazing for a, a very exciting day for all of us. On that day, we, we became independent. And so on that day, we will definitely like to show the world that how serious we are in bringing in place all these things. So in the end, if anybody wants to give any comment, the departing comments, please just unmute, unmute your mic and say anything you like, any session, anything, just anything, please. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, amazing uh, webinar. And on this platform, I would like to uh, uh, request all of uh, the participants that uh, let's uh, collaborate in such a way that I want to see in next couple of months, the projects from Pakistan on coin market. We, we need to be a part of the system. We are still developing, we have developers who are developing for other countries for uh, out, uh, outside Pakistan. We need, we have a lot of potential, a lot of assets that we can use. We can implement these technologies, these assets to be a part of the system. Now we need to be a part of the system instead of just watching and observing the people who are uh, the part of the system and being, uh, of course, motivation is a good thing, but it's a time to act. This is my request to all of you. Thank you very much. Amar, I'd like to thank you for bringing us all together, bringing some great minds together. Um, great, great conversation, great interaction. Um, let's let's keep this momentum going. And if there's anything I can help with, guys, do reach out. This is Ahmed Hamda with uh, Decrypted Solutions. Thank you yes. very much, Amar. It, it was a pleasure here, and it was very informative uh, and enlightening experience. Uh, as always, and uh, the concepts by the, the concept of lag zone by David is a remarkable idea. I think it could be a game changer. And it was a pleasure hearing everybody. Thank you very much. Um, Amar Saab, I would also like to uh, just, you know, home in to say thank you so much for making me part of this initiative. It's something remarkable which you're doing for not only for Pakistan, but also for the region. Because uh, if we stand educated, we have a better chance of not only uh, making the government structures, but also other policy relevant circles to understand the importance of the transformation which is underway. Um, on behalf of the South Asian Strategic Stability Institute University, I would like to, um, you know, give an open offer to all other partners that uh, we work in the policy domain in terms of providing policy input. We'd be more than happy if uh, some of you can give some um, input um, to write a non-paper on it or maybe to come up with uh, uh, some fact sheets which can be then given to the national parliament um, as well to other policy stakeholders so that uh, we are able to take uh, hold of not only this, uh, these developments but also um, to, to be part of this uh, change. Uh, I think we are already a little late, but it's not late if we are able to pick up the pace. And I think we have enough people on, uh, in terms of quality that we can uh, make the necessary changes happen. So once again, sir, thank you so much uh, for giving me an opportunity. And also on behalf of the center, I would like to uh, extend my deepest gratitude uh, for uh, taking this initiative forward. Um I also want to add something, uh, uh, Saramar. I'm from uh, Motbarali. I'm from Youth Parliament Pakistan, and I'm really thankful to you. Such a healthy uh, session uh, you arrange, and uh, thank you for uh, being a part of us. And um, in future, um, we are ready, and uh, we will try our level best for achieve our goals. Thank you so much. David, your last comments, <laughs> my friend David. <laughs> The potential in Pakistan. I told you much earlier. Lot of potential in Pakistan. Please go ahead. I'm just very grateful to be here, and I'm uh, really looking forward to um, 
uh, really making something. So uh, less Zoom calls and more making. Thank you. And um, I am very grateful for the comments and, and distress for the, the importance of integrating technology with both the legal aspects, but also on the the on ground adoption, uh, trust and comprehension by people who will have to use this technology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, this was Sunday. I know you must have been very committed. And thank you all for your time. Looking forward You're to welcome, see you all. Sir. Thank you, sir, Amar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amar Sahib. Thank you, Alapis. Thank you very much to all mighty speakers. Thank you very much.